Okay, good afternoon. We are going to call the March 12th board work session to order. We can begin with a roll call, please, starting down with director. Dave Larson, District 5. Terrence Proctor, District 4. Dr. Consi Pedroza, Interim Superintendent. And Charlie Simpson, District 3. All right, welcome to our guests and persons online. I need a motion to approve the agenda of March 12th board work session. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, so we are going to move on to our public comment. We do have a public comment that was sent in. If you'd like to make a public comment, you can sign up with the public comment sheet, or for those attending online, you can raise your hand or type your name in the chat. If there are no signups on the public comment sheet, let's just proceed. But I do have a one that I can read while we're waiting. So the public comment was sent by Tim Renz. I apologize if I said the last name wrong. A parent, foster high school science teacher, and a long time Tukwila School District staff. As mentioned in the public comments of the TSD regular board meeting held on February 27, 2024, I placed petitions in both English and Spanish at each of the three elementary schools in the afternoon of February the 28th of 2024 to collect signatures of support for continuing the school district subsidies for the Champions program. The petitions were only out and available for less than a day as the Champions program manager asked the Champions building leads to remove the petitions on February 29th in fear of retribution from the district. <clears throat> It is likely that not all parents even got to see the petition. I collected the petitions the afternoon of March the 7th and they had not been put back out. Still in less than 24 hours, a total of 100 signatures from parents and district staff were collected. There were 24 from Tuckwell Elementary, 54 from Thorndike Elementary and 22 from Cascade View Elementary. These also represent 97 students and 24 district staff and community members who don't have children using the champion services directly. This is an overwhelming response in such a short period of time. Imagine how many more signatures would have been collected if the petition weren't removed after only one day. Speaking on behalf of the 100 people who signed the petition in the short window that was available and expected especially the 97 students who are sure to be negatively impacted by the short-sighted decision to remove the district subsidy for the Champions Program mid-year in violation of the year-long service agreement, aka contract, that these families entered into with the district and Champions. I urge the district to reinstate the subsidies for the remainder of the school year and look at a possible solution for the future. I have the original copies of the position if needed. Thank you. For your consideration, I am open and willing to discuss this matter further. And they did also bring us the list of those who signed. So we do have those. Is there anyone that has raised their hand or anyone for public? Okay. We are moving to our discussion items. Our first discussion item is the strategic plan. Who will be presenting? Okay, 
Um, yes, our um, Scott Whitbeck, Chief Academic Officer. Alison Dino, Executive Director of Multilingual Services and Pre-K-12 Education. And our um, presentation here, we go back one slide. Uh, it's a, a data analysis of the data we have um, related to teaching and learning and um, related to the first goal and strategic plan, the high expectations and excellence for all. And we know all of our work, we try to make sure it's always related to pretty much always all four um, goals and strategic plan, but this um, presentation is particularly about high expectations and excellence for all. You know, this connection of equity work plus school improvement focus and strategic plan all go together. Okay, this is just showing what our, um, what our goals for high expectations is. Believe in graduating responsible, civically engaged students. Believe in using resources responsibly to produce successful student outcomes. With the outcome, student achievement increases as a result of our high quality instruction. And one of our metrics here is percentage of students meeting the standard on assessments in English, language arts and mathematics. So this is particularly about the Smarter Balance Assessment, the state test, once a year. And the goal here is all students increasing by 10% in each core area, English language arts, mathematics, and science, as reported by OSPI for this school year and each subsequent year. That'd be a 10%, so it's like, if it's 25% the next year, it's 35, 45, that's the progression. Oh, yeah, I guess that's a question because this always comes up when you say 10%. Is that percentage points or 10%? And what you just told me is it's 10 percentage points. Yes. Which, yeah, I, you really should put in here 10 percentage points because that's a constant that's confusion when you say 10%. Right. They wonder if it's a calculation of, but it's just. Okay. Because 10 flat. percentage points is quite a bit more than 10%. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And here's our mid-year progress and next steps based on that. On spring 2023, this past spring, it shows the percentages here of students who met the standards in each of the tested areas. And school teams are implementing their interim assessments this school year that are directly connected and aligned to the Smart Balance test um, in order to support student preparation. So we know it's for a couple benefits, it's for to gauge where students are so we know how to focus our teaching to exactly what the students need and ready for and helps kids reduce their stress of having to take a test online. And uh, on, for next steps, our ongoing teaching and learning work is around inclusive practices um, and, it, and which will help reduce some gaps we're seeing between our students who are farthest from educational justice. And, um, and so we and specifically focus now on the adoptions of math and elementary and science at middle school. And these processes were selecting materials and creating a professional development plan specifically to work towards guaranteed viable curriculum. So all students have an opportunity to learn and the right amount of time and supports to learn. Our next goal, a percentage of third and seventh grade students meeting their stretch goal in I Ready reading and math. And this may be familiar to the board, but just for um, the record, uh, we know our, um, on iReady, they have typical growth goals, and that means wherever the students started out, by the end of the year, they're like, have kept up, like say, a grade level progress in one year. If they start out right on grade level, they end the year on grade level. If they start out below, they still in the same distance below. So we look at um, just typical growth, stretch growth, the way it's been designed on the, um, the test, is if a student makes their stretch goal two years in a row, they will be at grade level no matter where they started. Pretty great just to know that. And this is extremely tightly aligned to the state test. When they do well on um, Friday, it's like, I think 0.8 or better um, um, reliability that they're going to pass the state test. So the goal specifically is reaching stretch goal in reading and math and increasing that by 10 percentage points each year.
and just familiar with our equity analysis and the next steps. So we analyzed our data based on their, our five questions that are shown up here. Who are their underrepresented groups? What are the potential impacts? Does this policy program practice or decision worsen existing disparities or produce other unintended impacts? Number three, how have we intentionally involved stakeholders who are also members of the communities affected by the policy practice or decision? Number four, what are the barriers to more equitable outcomes? And number five, how will we mitigate the negative impacts and address the barriers? So who are they, who, which students are affected? What are we doing? What do we have in place that can, might be causing them? Um, how are we involving people to address it? What are barriers and what are we gonna do about the barriers to get them out of the way? I, I guess one of the, and you kind of cover it in the next question as we start to do the race and equity analysis, but when you say percentage of third and seventh graders meeting their stretch goal and I ready, I think we need a, a little more focus there, particularly on the students that are two or more grade levels behind because, you know, um, I mean, the students that are way ahead could very well meet their stretch goal disproportionately in which case we really haven't moved the needle much at all. So um, it would be nice in here. And yeah, you kind of covered a little bit on the, as you go into the deeper analysis, but I think the focus needs to be on those students that are farthest, you know, as you say, uh, away from educational attainment, which yes. are those that are two or more grade levels behind and make right. sure that those are the ones that were getting their stretch goals, because yes. that's the only way that, that we're gonna grow out of this. Exactly, so we really want it to be designed. So even students, if they're already ahead of grade level, we don't want them to lose their right. strengths. We wanna keep, they at least keep typical growth, so they stay ahead, and students who are on grade level stay at least, or we grow even more. And they said the farther behind, the more intentionality we need to give them and really get to know them, how they learn best, not necessarily assuming it might be how I learned best when I was a kid, how do they learn best? and um, really work toward those specific standards so they can make stretch growth. It's it's a rigorous thing, but it can be that we have had a lot of kids already by mid-year reach their end of year stretch goal already. So we know that we're on the right track instructionally. But I guess I'd like I would like to see as we, as we go forward these these goals a little more focused rather than just saying every you know all students meeting their stretch goals. I mean, we, I think we need a little more focus on the students that are farthest away. Those mm -hmm. are, that's where we need to really get finely tuned focus yeah, on. That's a good point. So. And this morning at our um, principal and assistant principal professional development, we did talk through, and this is the last couple of meetings we're continuing, is looking at um, how do you design, you know, what are the well-designed goals? So for example, like a two-parter where you have one trajectory of growth for kids who are on or above, and a more accelerated trajectory for kids who are below. Farther below, the more steep the trajectory we're looking for them, so it won't take long to catch up. So we are working on that. They'll be appearing in school improvement plans. We're reporting out today on the goals as they were written for this year's strategic plan. Yeah. We'll take all this feedback as we create the goals for next year's right. and we refine them. So right. thank you. Yes. Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, so I'll just repeat that. Um, so um, we, you shared about the principals working on smart goal refinement. Um, can you share a little bit too about uh, the work you're doing with the iReady group and what you did um, with our school-based staff and what, what the principals are engaging in as well in mm -hmm. terms of their work, just the refinement pieces? Sure. Um, one of the things we're doing in our, in our meetings together is looking at the different types of data. We know for the street data, for example, we're looking at the satellite, the high level, which is some of these test scores, the map data, a little closer down, and then the street data, which is feet on the ground. And that, that's really the relational part. We're looking at ways that um, school staff can uh, get input from kids themselves mm -hmm. and their families of what works best for them for learning and feeling included, which, you know, that feeling of inclusion 
is a basis for students to be able to excel academically. So that's um, part of what we're studying as a whole, a whole group and it's ongoing. It's not like a one time, one and done, it's ongoing study. I think it's our fourth one. Okay, so the underrepresented groups, and this is specific to the data we um, received. So in reading and math, both subject areas, and this is true for all grade levels, our underrepresented groups um, are Black students, Hawaiian Pacific Islander, and Latinx students. So another part of this question, uh, the toolkit, what are potential impacts? Students who are two or more grades below in reading and math and identified groups may not be able to meet grade level standards at the end of the year. So um, we see that, like we had just talked about earlier, that that's why the urgency of creating um, instructional plans and school supports so um, kids who are farthest behind have the opportunity to make the greatest gains and reduce the amount of time before they hit grade level. And specifically focused for the for our targeted students who are um, not yet you know, have an opportunity to meet their potential. <clears throat> Question two of the racial equity toolkit, does this policy program practice or decision worsen existing disparities or produce other intended impacts? So the existing ones are current racial disparities at the end of second diagnostic, which is the mid-year, for I already are in alignment with past practices. So, um, Unfortunately, it's the gaps we've had before continue to be the same gaps. Um, one positive outcome from the second diagnostic window that just finished indicates a previously observed trend of students falling further behind with each successive grade level was not observed this time. So that's a change in data pattern, which is very helpful. In the past have been the higher, the more years they were here, the farther they got behind as a pattern. And obviously that was very troubling. And so we knew we had to address that. And so now we're seeing this is the first time I believe in some time where that has not happened. The, the growth um, for students, the longer they've been here, does not indicate um, they're, they're losing ground, they're keeping up. Question, what, um, what is the practice that has helped to like shift that? Mm -hmm. I think some of the practices are with our race and equity leads at the buildings. We have ongoing, this is our third year of training um, with our two consultants and specialists in their area our race and equity leaders at each school, two per school. They're working with the principals and with their leadership teams to talk about um, what the eye-opening of what, how are, um, how are students maybe not being served well? What do we, what do we not know that we need to know to engage with them? Maybe more family connection, establishing. I really, really believe that when more students feel like they count, they are seen and known and believed in, that is a ground, that gives them an opportunity to, um, to achieve. Without that, it's a, like a wall that will um, help them maybe not feel like more hopeless, like they don't feel like they can't, they're not given opportunity to succeed. So that's a big part, I think, is the foundation that we're going to continue to work on. I would say too, these reading scores are definitely a lagging indicator, meaning things happened before, like we have the data. And so <clears throat> Other like systemic changes we made, we have um, fewer exclusionary courses for students at the secondary level this year than we had previously. And we're uh, doing more push in supports kind of across our elementaries as we talked about last spring, moving away from some of those practices with our multilingual learners where they're being removed during core instruction. We're not doing those pull out things as much as we have been in the past. Obviously, I will say that that's correlational, right? We haven't done a peer-reviewed study to see if that may, has made a causational difference, but that's a shift systemically that we're seeing in all of our schools this year, in addition to the attention to the belongingness mm -hmm. components of the racial anti-racism and racial. Um, but it's a we'll want to watch and see if this is a blip or if this is the start of a new trend. Uh, and it is definitely a key component of our work under Dr. Pedrosa with working towards inclusionary practices and making sure teachers have the necessary skills so that they can meet students' needs in the classroom in the tier one setting. As Dr. Dean referred to, um, we are really looking at the practice of keeping the students in their core classroom at any, as much as at all possible. We know that if they stay with a teacher with a bachelor's or master's degree or higher, 
they will have every opportunity to succeed. If they're pulled out during that core time, they're missing some of the core that the rest of the kids that are in grade level are getting. Even if they get a small group, it might not be with a certificate teacher. It might be helpful, but we don't want them to miss the core instruction. So they might get extra in addition, but they're not missing core. They might have some support in the classrooms, but they are still have opportunity to learn everything that their peers are getting. Yeah, I guess, um, the, so this is kind of the first uh, time I've actually, I think, um, gone through the toolkit with this. So yes. one of the questions I had when I was reading this, kind of along the lines of what uh, Director Hoover was talking about, it says, so this question is, does this policy program practice Da, 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 da. Well, what is the policy program practice we're talking about here? And the response was I ready testing. And I don't think that's the right I ready that's testing a, is a measure. A yeah. What you just what you guys just described in terms of push in and that's the policy, I think, that we should be is that working or is that not working? I guess I would suggest too that any assessment we choose to give to students is a practice that we're yeah. engaging in. Right. And so mm -hmm. At this point, we're assessing the iReady data and we're seeing that it didn't deepen racial disparities. They were mirrored the same disparities on the assessment. And one of the things we're conjecturing is what are the reasons for the changes there? I so, mean, this in the tool quit, toolkit, it gives a kind of all-encompassing all question. It names four things, policy, program, practice, decision. Sometimes, depending on what we're analyzing, it might be mostly one or maybe two of those elements, but maybe not all four. So that's why Dr. Dino said this is really focusing on the practice of how we assess what we're assessing with and what do we do with the information. I guess the other way, I mean, to me, the assessments are just measures of how, I mean, what we're trying to, the ultimate is to, is to improve student outcomes get higher levels of achievement in math and reading in this case. And mm -hmm. so then the question is, okay, how do we measure that? We're using iReady. And then what are the practice, but the real, to me, the, the crux is what are the practices that were instructional practices that we're using? And you just described a bunch of them that we want, that we I think are gonna raise the level. Right. So that's kind of the way mm -hmm. I'm looking at this, but um, okay. Um, the other thing I, on your uh, comment on the second one, positive outcome. So one of the outcomes when I was looking at the um, spring assessment that was kind of um, disturbing, particularly when we talk about, you know, these, these uh, racial uh, groups uh, that we're focusing on, uh, Black, Pacific Islander, and Latinx. If I look at, you know, the, like the math scores at the elementary level, and then I look at the math scores at the secondary level, i.e. So Walter, they're worse, significantly worse. Now, I mean, so that, I mean, I understand, you know, there's obviously we're doing these practices and it's not gonna be yeah. <laughs> like that, but that's to me a concerning <clears throat> issue to try and delve into, you know, kind of what's going on there. And maybe, maybe these practices that you're talking about address that issue. I don't know. I guess so we'll I see. I think in math at the elementary level specifically, this is the first year that we've had a, um, a scope and sequence for the math program that actually matches what is in the common core state standards mm -hmm. and the Washington learning standards. Mm -hmm. And so we have re so all math, all elementary teachers this year, were either teaching our existing math curriculum or one of two pilots. And we created scopes and sequence for all three sets of materials that more that align with the common core standards and moved units around so that students would be able to have access to all of the like key power standards before they hit the SBA, which we haven't done as a practice in the past. And so students at Showalter this year would not have had the benefit of that components. And then we'll be coming to you with a recommendation for a math adoption soon. And that's the purpose of going through that whole two-year process now with the math adoption is to make sure that we're identifying materials that match the standards that we're expected to teach and provide lots of instructional opportunities for teachers to engage in more inclusionary practices with kids. So yeah, and I, think I think so. I think we'll see some changes yeah, yeah, later, but yeah. particularly at Showalter yeah. for those scores for this year, those students weren't part of that. Like this right. is the first year we've been using those scopes and sequences, but it was a lot of work on the behalf of staff to make sure that we were setting folks up at the start of the year with those things. And that's great. And just to validate that, I can remember going back years, this is before Common Core, we had, we were again disjoint with um, what the test was. This is back in Wassel days. 
and we got a new curriculum at which was aligned and we did the same <laughs> COVID mm -hmm. and surprising the scores went up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you give the students what they need to know to do the test, big surprise, they do yes. well on tests. So I think that's, that's right on. And we never, yeah, you're right. We haven't done that uh, alignment with the common core. So I think that's, that's a, uh, a great thing to do, but I do want to make sure that we're kind of in the race and equity that we're keeping focused, particularly on on these these groups that you've identified, because um, I think there's more. Uh, I think scope and sequence work is is great, absolutely required. It helps everybody that doesn't require, but there are some additional things that I think, um, and maybe we'll get to them. And I, I haven't seen them, but I have some ideas. Anyway, I'll let you go on with the so questions. and. The schools and the teaching learning department have been doing lots of different things that we've talked to you throughout about throughout the year, like the different the math lab work that we're engaging in, and those that's all about the instructional practices and all about ensuring that students have voice in the classroom in those pieces. It's definitely not the focus of today, but you're it's many layered. It's never just going to be one right. thing. So, a toolkit question three. How have you intentionally involved stakeholders who are also members of the communities affected by this policy practice or decision? So um, right now it's been district uh, leaders working with principals like we did today and uh, recently with um, the consultant from MyReady and also with our state um, school leadership and school improvement coach. And we're doing one-on-one -on -one meetings just this past week again to um, to just dive into school specific data and look at issues like race and equity, which is are the differences for their school than the whole district as a, an overall trend. And what will they do in their school, in their specific school with a community to engage like the street data, personal conversations, asking how's this working? How do you feel about your instruction? How do you feel about class? What could be better for you? <clears throat> so that's part of outreach and um, I'll certainly talking with families who differ if one-on-one -on -one, just personal conversations, it could be through a family event, um, finding out from them too, they can give tips, say, you know, parents know um, what works well for the children and what we might be missing. Yeah, I just wanted to bring up a couple of um, examples because um, they're relevant here. I don't know, um, the, in the recent edition, of, this is the National Council of Teachers for Mathematics. Oops. Um, that are really interesting are supporting black students mathematical identity and so I mean there's there's a variety of things you can do this particular one talked about you know tracing the uh, origins of mathematics back to you know a lot of the origins come out of the continent of Africa in this case as you know one of the ways of addressing that issue um, there's another um, there's an old book from Robert Moses who's a civil rights activist and math teacher from uh, 2000 and his, his approach, he's teaching, you know, inner city schools in New York City. And, you know, one of his thing, things was kind of relating math to students' lives. And, you know, this is in New York City, for example. So he used like the subways to teach uh, number lines, you know, and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And so there's a variety of uh, techniques that I think are, you know, relate to a lot of them relating to students' lives that can, some of them can be, you know, kind of race uh, based and with an intention, intentional on it. And it was interesting. I was kind of looking through years ago as teach, helping teach math. This is our current math curriculum. And just looking through the booklet, there's really nothing in there that kind of addresses some of those issues. So hopefully, I don't know, you know, as we adopt a new math curriculum, but, and maybe it's supplemental, I don't know, but Anyway, there's a variety of ways that, you know, uh, math uh, can be uh, used. And, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to some of the, the student conversations, the other one about uh, student voice, because I know I've had over the years conversations with students in our district about, you know, so why do you think you're, you know, having trouble with math? And almost always it goes back to something in elementary school that they didn't get you know, fractions or long divisions or something. And then they got in their brain that they weren't good at math. And so, you know, that's an issue that we really, I, you know, I've been advocating for a while. I think we need to kind of go ask students, do you think you're good at math? And follow that number. Because if, if we got a lot of students thinking they are good at math, 
that's a problem for us, you know, and we need to kind of work on uh, relating and getting them into math and science, the same thing. So um, anyway, those are just some, some thoughts about kind of bringing some of this stuff um, into the race and equity as we start thinking about how we, how we uh, address some of these issues, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, toolkit question four. What are the barriers to more equitable outcomes? We've identified a couple here. Um, in, in consistent core instructional practices, coupled with an over-reliance on pullout, as we've mentioned a couple slides ago. So we're really focusing our professional development planning for spring and next year. What are the most effective practices to uh, have students really learn well and connected with the kids so they are confident in themselves as uh, capable learners? and uh, relying less on pull out more support within the, uh, their regular classrooms. That's, the, that's one of the biggest. Um, also, um, currently a barrier has been providing infrequent in-person coaching for teachers on instructional strategies. We just don't have a lot of coaching staff. We know the budget, it's, we're not like we're gonna be able to add a budget. So we just need to look at how are we going to build our capacity within the people who are here to do ongoing coaching, maybe peer coaching, maybe a teacher who's a veteran and extremely skilled and getting great results with kids across the border, across the whole spectrum. What maybe others can even be learning from observing their peers for highly effective practice. We need to get creative, but it's building the skill throughout the year, every year. I guess the other thing that has come up from time to time too is um, we have specialist math teachers, for example, at the secondary level. We don't have specialist math teachers at elementary. Why not? You know, that's another thing that have been talked. And I know, having observed, you know, there's teachers. Some elementary teachers are really good math. You know, they grasp it well, and some some of them not so much. So that's another thing to consider. You know, it obviously involves master scheduling and all those kind of complicated issues, but. In some cases, maybe that might be approach to so, another thought. One thing I would just add to that is just personal bias. I would like all educators to never say math is hard. If we say it, kids believe it, we say, of course you can do this, they can. We put it in their heads. So I think it's our job to make sure students see themselves as capable learners. We know everybody's brain can do math. It's all based on logic. Everybody can do it. But we just want it to not be the reason they have mental barriers against it. They need to see themselves as perfectly capable at every subject. So, well, on one hand, I love the way that we're structuring these and like really honing in on one thing. And also like it's hard to think about one aspect, right, separate mm -hmm. from all these other things, because I'm looking even at this slide before at the, you know, the, the groups who are most represented in you know, kind of being two or more grade levels behind and where the correlation with discipline is, right? So uh, if we're, you know, increasing inclusionary practices for instruction, that's amazing. Clearly that's impacting some, you know, some of the data that we're seeing now. But how, what about those young people that are being suspended or, uh, you know, other forms of just being sent out of the classroom for discipline, so the instruction that is missed then, and is there a correlation? My guess is yes, the answer is yes, is there is a connection, right, between also the disparities in discipline and then the disparities that we're seeing in the testing data. Would you agree that that's probably I guess true? it'd be yes, and with attendance. Like attendance. for any reason, students any reason. miss instruction, whether it's discipline or attendance for some other reason, Yes, there, I think there's this, probably a really strong correlation between yeah. time in class for the instruction versus the time you're not there. Do we see a higher, um, uh, or sorry, a lower attendance rate for our Black, Hawaiian, Latinx students? I think we did last last school year when we looked at the attendance okay. data. I know, it's been a while um, I know it, yeah. that the we definitely saw lower rates for our multilingual learners. Um, in attendance at that time, but we we can go back and look and get for for Dr. Pedrosa what the attendance data looks like by race at this point in the year. Yeah, and I think also I think that's something we can include because actually attendance is in the next engaged learners under engaged mm -hmm. learners, which is mm -hmm. next month. And then the other thing I would say is um, I also am curious about attendance now with 
the doubling of our McKinney-Vento students, our high poverty students. And so sort of wondering what that looks like from that frame as well. So um, um, we can, we'll make sure we'll have that data because that's part of the um, engaged learners profile, I believe. So we'll make sure we have that. Yeah, you just mentioned my favorite word engagement because if, if students are engaged with the material, yep. Yep. They'll, they'll come. <laughs> and is there any way to like, parse out that data so that we could actually see the growth from maybe young people who are attending regularly versus not versus yeah. discipline mm -hmm. all those. Okay. So then, you know, kind of to your point of like how we actually intentionally targeting strategies to support those individuals based on what's paid, possibly keeping them out of the classroom or mm -hmm. keeping them away from that porn structure. Okay, toolkit question five, how will we mitigate the negative impacts and address the barriers? Um, one big key, and Dr. Dino and um, Director Mott are leading this effort, the multi-tiered systems to support the MTSS team they're leading. It's a menu of high impact teaching strategies that we've been talking about. It's what are you doing with the kids once you have them in class? Um, this, we're developing that out to make it real specific and part of their training coaching for teachers and principals is what does that look like? And this will be the centerpiece for a professional learning program. And it's also connected to another acronym we hear, UDL, Universal Design um, for Learning. So that has a lot to do with just how do we provide multiple opportunities for kids to learn and express what they've learned. It isn't just one set way for everybody. Um, another, um, the second bullet is uh, just an example of this type of professional support, provide support of coaching and ways to differentiate instruction within the classroom minimizing the students receive instruction elsewhere. So we know that if um, teachers are, and they ask a very good question is, okay, good, if I have students in my classroom, I know some ways to differentiate, but what do you, what's a disrespect What is What does that look like? So part of our coaching and training is how, how do you set up a classroom so you can do differentiating? Um, so there's a number of ways that can be done effectively. So that's part of our um, narrowing and focusing on uh, coaching for this coming year. So Alex, do you have any, I, I know you've, you've worked in this area of kind of helping students get better in reading and math. Do you have any ideas about things we should do more of? I mean, I know you've been involved in the, yeah, push the red button, I think. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, an idea that I was thinking about, which um, I remember you said that you guys did for your last summer school is project-based learning. I feel like that's definitely more engaging for students because they have, they, I feel like they are more social, like with their peers and they are more engaged rather than mostly like a majority lecture-based. Yeah. Oh, record. Okay, got it. Um, another way to measure learning, but if uh, if the assessment is the way that we're measuring success, right, or growth or learning, what ideas do you have about how we can actually measure that differently? And then how do we capture that in a way that we can then look side by side with perhaps iReady data or other state test data that we maybe have to do um, and see, okay, well, maybe they didn't score well here because online assessments are what they are, right? But they have demonstrated knowledge and skill and learning here. And so maybe we don't care as much, right? About what that evaluation or state test says. Very good point um, that every assessment has value, but it's not the be all end all. It's one piece of information. Teachers have classroom-based assessments they come up with and various ways that students can show. You know, sometimes it's creating some kind of a written project. Sometimes it's verbally describing what they've learned. So there's a number of ways that um, students can express their learning and teachers can then ask them for deeper to see how deeply they understand that. So is the hope then that as you're creating and establishing this MTSS supports, I know that's redundant, mm -hmm. that's in this the yeah. acronym, um, that you'll maybe have some consistent classroom ass assessments 
uh, that that we could actually look at across the system. I mean, obviously, they're going to be a little bit different because the teacher's different and the students are different. Um, but yeah, so is that is that the hope? So I would say yes, and part of the UDL framework when when done really well is students have choice. And part of the choice is in how to display their knowledge for the teacher. So while we may not have, we may not end up with common assessments per se that every kid is taking the same assessment in the same, same classroom-based assessment in the same way, what we can work on is the reporting structures for the standards where then we can aggregate out how are we seeing that the student is meeting the standard. And then in a classroom, let's say in an elementary classroom of 22 or 23 students, the teacher's tracking which standards the students are meeting, as well as the means of showing the teacher that they've met that standard. If it's not on iReady or if it's not on the end of unit assessment, maybe there's a portfolio or some other way. And so from the district perspective, it may be more around tracking the standards being met and less around how did you prove that you met the standard? Because those are going to be, in a perfect world, they're going to be more individualized to the student. And what matters the most is that, oh, in this particular classroom, all of the students have met the standard, though, like Chief Whitback shared, they might have met, met it in a different way. So we're not looking at test results so much as standards um, attainment. That makes a lot of sense. And I think it goes without saying to a degree, um, but then that means we need to really understand, be aware of, and speak to the biases, right? That teachers may hold against individual young people or collectively um, to ensure that that's not impacting, right? Their perceived growth or not. Absolutely. Okay. Um... Also, uh, the next goal, percentage of ninth grade students who are on track to graduate. That means, we know that means passing all the classes in ninth grade. Um, so the percentage we have right now on track to graduate, our goal is to increase from about 74% in 2122 to about 79% by this spring and increase 5% each subsequent year. So we're looking for, um, again, just, you know, the 5% boost every year um, to, to um, bump that up over time. On mid-year progress and next steps. <clears throat> so at the end of um, last school year, 63% of ninth graders were on track for graduation. But at the end of the first semester of this school year, as 63% passed all their courses, a leading indicator of being on track to graduate. And so we know that is too low. So Foster mm -hmm. High School is in the process of revamping their master scheduling to give more kids opportunities to actually take the classes that they need and they're certainly ready for to be able to um, pass their classes and pass the credit bearing classes. And summer school also will focus on credit recovery. So that's, we have limited funds this year for summer school, but that would be one of our main focuses is credit recovery. Oops another area where I think we need to, you know, break, break out the race and equity uh, toolkit here because, so I asked, as I've asked before, for, you know, what are the disproportionalities related to ninth grade students? You know, I mean, it's nice to say overall, but that hides all the uh, stuff that's underneath. And it turns out um, that, you know, black students are significantly more likely to fail a course in ninth grade uh, than any, the disproportionality is, um, and I don't know, I, the answer was 36.5%. That doesn't really tell me anything. We need to know it relative to the, the total populations. And so if I do that calculation, it comes out to about, you know, um, I'd like to see, I guess, just a general statement. I'd like to see our disproportionalities stated as a number. So one is, you know, exactly proportional to the number of students more is overrepresented, less is underrepresented. It makes it much easier to, to see what the disproportionalities are. But so for black students, it's like 1.7, which is significantly overrepresented, which is not uh, desirable in this case. And so then, you know, the next immediate question after that is, okay, so what courses are they failing? You know, we need to dig down into that. And, and it, as has been the case before, it's, you know, predominantly math and science. And so then we just started to dig down into, so what's going on in math and science? 
And so, I mean, I just, I think we need to be doing a lot more depth, particularly on the risk and equity side on, on these issues and not just talking about the high level average stuff. And then, and then you get to, I mean, the story that I've told many times, I, this has been true in our district for a while. And, and one time I asked one of our black students why, and she happened to be very good at science. And a matter of fact, she's come and got advanced degrees in science why she thinks that you know uh, so many black students are failing that like a science ninth grade science course and she said well uh role models you know there's just not lacking role models and so there's a whole i mean as you say there's never one thing but there's always a collection of things and we need to start assembling this collection of things and start you know getting those role models for science and we there's plenty of them in our area in front of students and and so forth and so on so anyway i just think you know a lot of the stuff we need to kind of get down into the into the depths yeah. of it and start talking about um, uh, the details and unpacking it and then coming up with strategies to address those. So. And I will say at the school level, that's what they're doing. So like, for example, I'll just share a little anecdotal information of things that have happened this year. So one example is our community liaisons. I was invited to a meeting with the community liaisons who reported a problem of practice that they observed where they were helping students in after school, before school with tutoring, and the students were still not able to uh, get their grades changed, right? And so that is back to when we talk about student profile, right, on standards. How can the students show if they can't pass this one test, right? What's other ways to demonstrate learning in that classroom? So I think when I think about equity, I think about grading practices. Right. When I think about racial, like, so an anti, I'm going to say anti racism. When I think of anti racism, I think of grading practices. When I think of anti racism, I think what barriers are we putting in front of kids before they can even take a class? Like there's all these things. So it's very multi layered. So one of the things, because I do supervise Foster High School, is every time we have these kinds of convenings, right? When the community liaisons came to us with a problem of practice, then we make sure that our principal, who you all met and is amazing, then she takes that work and brings it down. And so that's one of the things that she committed to is bringing the community liaisons with the counselors, with the career specialists together to sort of problem solve some of these things with some of the teachers. And so there are some things that she's identified. I, 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 we did email her the slide. And so she gave us some, and probably Allison and um, Dr. Dino and Chief Wetbeck can probably pull that up and share some of the things that they're doing. But at the school level, these are things that they're working on as a problem of practice. And um, is that gonna solve the grading for learning practice Not right away? No, but it is something that we have to talk about as a system because um, there are barriers uh, in our schools, all of our schools where students are not getting access to, we just said it, core curriculum. They're not getting access to credits. And so that is, those are the things that we're relying on our leadership teams, our equity teams, and our, our, our um, principals to sort of break down in their community. And it's going to be chip by chip by chip. <laughs> and so, but there are things that we're working on systemically. So, for example, the inclusionary practices, the MTSS, because we don't want five different MTSS systems. We want one for Tukwila School District. Uh, we don't want five different, you know what I'm saying? So we're trying to do all this alignment work mm -hmm. with a common curriculum. So we're, in, we're, we're, <clears throat> we're plugging through and we're doing everything we can from the system level. And at the same time, really uh, leaning on our principals when we give them this information, because you can't fix what you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. um, students and the liaisons and students are telling us this is a problem and really having principals and their leadership teams lean in. Um, and which I actually am seeing evidence of. So I think that's critical is, and so you're right, it's multi-layered. Um, for example, high school and beyond plans. Now we have a goal around that. And the expectation from the state is 12th grade. Nope, that's too late for us. We need to start earlier, right? So we're starting in eighth grade. There's little things that we're trying to do to change the system. We're doing a lot of things this year. And I'm gonna say people are tired. <laughs> They're really tired which I want to thank everyone digging in at the school level, staff level, but we still have a long way to go. I'm not, I'm not sugarcoating that. We have a long way to go. And I think everyone recognizes that. 
So yeah, Principal Parker, just to share out some of the things specifically for ninth graders that they're working on this semester. Um, they hired a reading specialist focused specifically on supporting ninth graders in their English language arts classes, one of the courses that also has a high failure rate. They're, they have two multilingual coaches co-planning with teachers to support core subjects, math, science, history, and English to really help support the students and build the um, levels of the teachers. Ninth grade advisory teachers are the math teachers who use their time during advisory check-in with math and solve problems of the week. Uh, additionally, Algebra 1 Semester 1 class is also taught during second semester so that students can continue to practice their algebra skills. And they have emphasized their after-school tutoring, which is available for all students to ninth graders. And so there are those are some of the practices that Foster is putting in place this semester in response to what they saw in some of the F data from ninth graders in the um, in the first semester. And then next year, they're raising expectations for all their students by um, piloting a ninth grade honors for all in their English language arts courses to kind of raise the expectations and supports for kids. So the like Dr. Pedrosa was saying, what the staff and leadership are doing at Foster is gonna make the most immediate impact for students. And I also hope, as you talked about systems, is that we also start thinking about you know vertical systems. So, so not just within the building, but Foster should be giving some feedback to Showalter should be giving feedback to the elementary schools. And I haven't seen a lot of that go on. It's very siloed. And so we need feedback going all up and down the line to make sure that, because some things really do need to be, you know, I think, you know, a big a significant part of it is going to be solving it at a lower, you know, raising the bar at the lower level, which then raises the bar all the way up. So anyway. The MTSS, uh, that should help, right? Because if we're doing one that is system wide, um, that could yeah, more system more system wide things about, I think right? are yeah. good. But but getting yeah, getting the principals engaged, you know, across, I, particularly on the academics, I haven't seen a whole lot of that yet. But I mean, the structure is yeah, yeah good. I was gonna say all our principal meetings we meet every month, twice. We meet for an hour and a half to two hours, and specifically on focus on instruction. So mm -hmm. we kept those pure. And we invite everybody. Mm -hmm. So we have them early in the morning. So the assistant principals, the high school principal, middle school, elementary, all every school leader, plus everyone here, <laughs> we're all in the same room together once a month, mandatory. I text everybody if they're late, even they can tell you, <laughs> you're late. I, okay, okay, I'm on my way. <laughs> and then two people pop in. It's been great. Um, but we do this and it's focused on instruction, focus on academics, focus on inclusion because everyone needs to be on the same page. So for example, we have a new CFO. She is in these meetings. So she hears what the principals are learning so that when we're making budget conversations, she knows where we're headed. Same with human resources. They're there as well. Communications, everyone's together. And then we add on top of that, we do um, we do uh, uh, once a month, a month, we're doing anti-racist training on top of that for another two hours. Uh, and that includes the principals, the assistant principals, this team here, as well as every director in the system, because we all need to be in alignment around what does that actually mean and look like. So we, and then we actually, we actually, it was beautiful today. We actually saw connections between the work we were doing with Dr. Rajasard and the work we were doing. There was a lot of connections and people were slightly starting to see the connections, but nobody gets to opt out. It's required and everyone has to be there. <laughs> so, um, and then I'm hoping that when we launch our student advisory, that's another piece to, to, the, to that vertical alignment work. So, um, and I think with the instructional council, right? That includes teachers the MTSS team includes teachers. So we're making sort of a web <laughs> of collaboration in the whole system so that we are all talking to each other in various ways, but the goal is to be aligned. There's, we, we, we're, not, we're, not, um, we're not a system of schools, we're one school system. Right. And that's the goal. Um, so just two quick other thoughts to add. I think those anecdotes are actually really helpful in those specific things, because um, obviously, you know, these reports are sharing kind of the really the big picture. But for me, that gives me something tangible to then come back and say, I remember y'all mentioned this. How's that going? Right. To actually really be able to connect back to the goal. Um, so, you know, they don't necessarily have to be included in the presentation, but I think definitely be prepared with some of those things um, as we're, you know, as we're continuing to move through. Um, so. 
thinking about this goal of like high expectation. So there was a student last year who um, left our district. And one of the reasons that it was communicated to me that she left the district was because um, the expectations of students were just really low, right? Teachers didn't expect much from students and they didn't feel like they were really being challenged, right? Or pushed. Um, and that's a mindset, right? Not, not as much about it, in, instructional habits, right? And more about a mindset about what we believe about students. I think it also like goes back to grading practice. It goes back to like, um, you know, oh, you didn't get that done. No worries. I'll just, you know, mark you as whatever, right? Um, like all of those. So I guess, how are we starting to really address those things as well? The mindsets of the teachers that are working with our students um, and not just the outcome of the test scores. I think that goes back to what Dr. Pedrosa was talking about with our racial equity work with um, principal leaders and leaders across the system uh, around leaning into, we've all been in spaces in our lives where we hear something and like, oh, that doesn't really sit right with me. Like the, what do you do next part? Um, part of it is equipping people with the strategy so they know what to do. And then the other big part is you act the way you believe, right? And so what are the beliefs that we're working on? And it's really making sure that we have high expectations for everyone in our system so that everyone knows when they come, you're bringing your best self forward and that uh, we, ex we believe that children can achieve. And that's part of being in Tukwila. And so that is a big mindset shift and work that we're doing and all the work with Dr. Rogers Ard and all the work with our principals and that Dr. Pedrosa is leading us through with the anti-racist practices are we actually just talked really specifically about belief and mindset in adults today that when we think about inclusionary practices, it's not about changing kids, it's about changing what the adults are doing and what the adults are believing for students. Yeah, just to, just to add on to that, I've, over the, I've asked students why they do Running Start. And one of the reasons is they want more challenging coursework. Yeah. They also want college credit, which is another one. And the third one I've heard is, you know, I don't want to put up with the drama of high school. Okay, I'm not sure I can do a whole lot about that one. But anyway, the, the first two. So, you know, we can keep more uh, uh, students in, in the school, you know, not only leaving the school district, but just keep them from going to Highline or whatever. So yeah. I don't know, Alex, how do you feel about that? You're a Running Start student. Is that... What, what, why did you go to Running Start? Why are you doing Running Start, for example? Oh, yeah, I would say the main reason I'm going to Running Start, which is like what we've discussed here a few times, um, was like kind of the lack of AP courses for like juniors and seniors. Like when you're a sophomore, you do get the option of um, AP Human Geography and AP Psychology, but I feel like for um, juniors, and seniors, the the courses that I want to take that the, in the career path I'm interested in weren't really there, but like there were core subjects like cal like physics and calculus, I'm pretty sure. But I feel like Running Start just gave like a more um, wide variety of challenging courses, and I'm pretty sure a lot of my peers think it is. In a minute since I've looked at the CEE survey, um, which I know is a part of. Next left sides. Is there a question in there that asks about um, like students feeling challenged? Something like, I guess, if not, how could we get that information? We can, we can always add. I mean, we have the ability as a district to add any question we want to mm -hmm. the CE. So, so if, yeah, the one I've wished we could ask the elementary schools, schools for students for a while is you know, the question of, are you good? Do you feel like you're good at math? And just watch that over time, see what happens. Yeah, I, th I know there's a direct correlation on that. Right? <laughs> um, and also uh, what I, I'm almost wondering, to be honest, I do want to relook at surveying, right? Because um, I don't think we have to ask a hundred questions or 50 questions. I wonder if we have a few questions that are really targeted and specific mm -hmm. around for example, um, you know, do I, you know, do I, am I observing, you know, am I, am, is, let's just ask the question, is there, do I see racism, right? Is the one question, right? Or um, am I seeing, am I being treated fairly um, and respectfully, um, you know, 
every day. Like that's a very, like, I'm curious, is that, mm-hmm. is what are the students saying about that? Do I see myself in the curriculum, the things we just talked about? Do I that see myself? That one is there. Yeah, but do I see myself yeah. represented in the staff, right? Things that's like that. One, yeah. So um, do I see alignment between the vision of the district or the vision of the school with what's happening in my experience? There's just so many things you could ask, but I, and I know this because I spent a lot of time developing survey questions with a bunch of people to make sure and um, but I wonder what does it mean to be, when we talk about culture responsive, student identity, the big th- three for me are uh, student identity, uh, culture responsive teaching practices, and then um, um, making sure that there's belonging, right? a sense of belonging in the school. And then the last one I would say is how do we make sure the questions are not just about the kid, the student, but also what are the adult practices and how are those alignment? And if there's misalignment as well, between what the students are saying and what the adults are saying. I think those are really, would be critical for me to think through, because we wanna make sure that what the students are saying, you know, that yes, I believe all the teachers, you know, and then the teachers say, I believe, you know, that those are correlated, right? So I'm concerned. And that, that analysis is provided to us through, yeah. through CE, yeah. Yeah. and yeah. not only that, but also yeah. the, the family, yeah. the student. I mean, there's yeah. all kind of interesting yeah. Yeah. examined yeah. what's what's different between those perceptions yeah. of those three different groups. Yeah. yeah, but I think to your point, like I think there's uh, similar to how I want to relook at our policy about assessments. Um, I, I, I think we should reevaluate our survey process, right? Because in CE, what we do twice a year, yeah. once a year. Once a year. So I think it's even more important to think about like, you're basically trying to capture, okay, so let's say a senior takes that CEE survey. You can't do anything to really impact their experience, right? And that's once a year, it's at the end of the school year, right? Versus what if we did like a a pulse check once a week, even one question on the amazing communication that goes out to teachers every week, just a pulse question, right? About a million different things and our communications that go out to parents, our monthly newsletter, pulse question, right? So simple one question where we can actually see it more concretely over time and actually be able to address some of those things more in the moment rather than waiting until the end of the year when maybe they've been feeling that sense of exclusion or that uh, those, you know, maybe microaggressions for an entire year and they haven't been addressed, right? Um, so I just think that could yeah. be another topic that I would love to add to an agenda. Sometimes. Yeah, I think I think I see there's a, there's kind of too many questions yeah, at this point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and then yeah, so if we, and and we're also giving the time like when students are kind of exhausted because they're taking yeah. all their inches. You know, da, da, yeah. da, da, da. So I think yeah, a more um, uh, abbreviated, focused you know, flexible um, assessments or a um, survey system would probably be a good wanna, thing to do in our spare time. Well, yeah. <laughs> in my, my sense of belongingness might change based on what happened that day, right? Sure. Um, and so it's so much going to be colored by their experience in that moment versus, again, perhaps. You know. There's research, I was going to say, there's research. I had this You're on right. the whole time. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> there's research on actually dips we all know this like in schools like school culture right so when school culture is feeling really really great and then the dips like and there's research and march is a low time by the way for people when it it starts getting lower (laughs) because all the crunch times and so um there's research around that and i think um i think it's just a test i think we would see the student data completely reflected in that completely in terms of um how the adults are feeling in the school compared, and then that would probably mirror what the students are saying as well. Turn it off. <laughs> okay, our next goal, a percentage of positive scores on staff um, as we educational effective survey staff high standards and expectations. So our specific goal in that area, percentage of staff who answer positively on the survey in the areas of high standards and expectations will increase from the most recent 66% to 71% by this spring. So looking for at least a five point in, increase in the percent of staff who answer positively there. and mid-year progress and next steps related to that survey. Um, Again, staff will take the survey again this spring. 
uh, school leaders and racial equity leads who have been meeting at least monthly for the three years now are beginning to meet jointly. We have two more of those meetings um, this spring for the purpose of the district's movement toward becoming an anti-racist school district. And that's becoming a term we all, it's just a term we're using now that is the expectation for us district-wide, addressing bias as a key lever and looking at that. <clears throat> on the key uh, teaching and learning department next steps, developing a district-wide MTSS and inclusionary practice project, understanding implementation. Dr. Dino described that. Uh, next bullet, I already goal setting for individual students based on their typical or stretch growth. So working with students to talk about what do they think will be their growth? What can they aim for? <clears throat> uh, grant funding through OSPI's program specific grants to support the continued planning and implementation for heritage language and dual language programming. Continue developing that. A grant funding through Title IIA um, program to reimburse staff for receiving the endorsements in English language, multilingual or bilingual programs. And the leadership support through anti-racist professional learning and coaching and the ongoing joint meetings with race and equity leader teams and principals and this includes race and equity as well as inclusion as core elements. And that will be a thread throughout the PDs. And along with that, that's we're just beginning the initiative where every school's two race and equity lead teachers um, will or staff members will join with principals and site teams to plan the PD sessions for next year. And how are they going to tie in race and equity so it's a core of the entire PD? If you have a two or three hour PD, it's not stand for 10 minutes and talk about race and then go on to something else. It's together. It can't be separate to have any benefit to students. So that's gonna be a key part of what you'll see next year in our plan. This might be a kind of a silly question and I mean zero disrespect with, it, with this question. So obviously we've got so many fabulous educators, right? that are very skilled at teaching young people. And then there's a different skill set around teaching adult learners. And so is there going to be support or professional development for the people that are crafting these professional development opportunities? Because it's not just something that, yeah, it's, a, it's just a different skill set. Yes. Yeah, so to that end, we're working with an outside group, Educational Impact Exchange this year through our math learning labs and a big, so they have been delivering the professional learning to our staff and like a parallel component to that is we have two staff members who they are like training up so that they have those skills more with adult learning theory so that they can present and provide professional learning targeted towards adults because it's a it's a different skill set and a different way of attending to sense making with children than with adults and so part of this um Part of what we're working with them on is a gradual release of responsibility over the course of the year so that they were heavily leading and doing all the preparation for the sessions at the beginning. And then they're um, slowly weaning back and our staff are stepping forward more so that they're ready next year to fully take over those, um, the learning lab components and what we can take, what we can take forward from that and make it work for us in Tukwila across the board. Uh, but yeah, no, it's, we have to attend to the, and the learning of our instructional coach, the people who provide different instructional coaching services in the school district um, have been working on learning how to be more, be a coach of adult learners. They've been attending some other outside trainings on collaboration and co-planning through the Puget Sound DSD, but developing their skill set in that end, in addition to developing the strategies for working with kids. I guess the, the other part of the instruction, um, yeah, teaching or professional development is how much of it is, you know, kind of the whole traditional sit and get versus how much of it is what, what we call just in time training or, you know, actually on the job day to day training, which I know when we went through the, all the introduction of technology, you know, the, the kind of uh, a coach sitting with a teacher working through their, their day to day job and, and coaching in that is a, is a much more effective way to get that's That may not be true in all fields, but anyway, that I assume that's a, a key. It sounds like from the many uses of the word coaching here you have, that that's kind of a key part of the strategy as well. Okay, great. Yeah, and there are, um, 
I would say good facilitators to adults are not going to do the sit and get, right? They're going to be interactive, as you've probably seen in some of our beloved partner trainings. Um, so like, yeah, I would say anyone that we're contracting with to come and do adult learning trainings, hopefully that's not the model. And if so, then let's let's look into that. We could probably get some other more effective facilitators because that's not how adults learn either. Um, certainly not how kids learn, and that's definitely not how adults learn. But there's another level beyond. I mean, you can have a training that's involved in the student, but then there's another element of training that is actually where the teacher, you're in there with the teacher in their classroom sure. every from day to day, coaching how the, you know. How, which is coaching slightly yeah. different from Which training, is a little, right? that's yeah, a different, little yeah. different level of that yeah. approach as well, which also I think is quite valuable for a lot of teachers because sometimes, you know, you may get trained, but then if you aren't using it, then it just kind of goes out. <laughs> Yeah, I have a question. So uh, <clears throat> I'm assuming that this is going to be done every time. So it's it's kind of maybe standard practice and tell me if I'm wrong. I'm not the professional you guys are that at ninth grade, you're going to take a measure and then it's going to fall through like with our young man here. So we should have the data from our ninth graders from his group. Is that true? So it's actually on the state report card also. So okay. it's data that we report out to OSPI. So we, ever since they've been asking us to track ninth grade on time graduation, we can track those um, overall percentages. Okay. And getting to my That's point is um, looking at the numbers that you've brought up today. So currently um, I'm assuming, and you can tell me one way or the other, is only 64% of our students going to graduate this year, our, our seniors? No, this data was specific to ninth graders. Okay, so we'd have to we can bring we can bring forward what uh, how many of our twelfth graders are on track today to graduate and how many are at risk. We can bring that information to Dr. Pedros. I don't have it today. Yeah, if we could do that, I would be curious because um, I want to make sure that yes, I see the the point, the focus of the ninth graders because that's what we're required for. But I want to make sure that our tenth, eleventh, and twelfth graders, where we're at with them, what our plan is with them. Uh, we have less time with them. And so, and who is going to graduate this year and what's our plan around that? I'm kind of curious about that. So just if we could either, you know, email or something would be, would be very helpful. Thank you. What's, what's interesting about that too, is if you follow, so they, they selected ninth grade as an early warning indicators, cause you want to get on it, you know, as soon as possible. But, you know, I think it's safe to say year after year, you know, like 63% passed. And yet by the time we get up to um, graduation, now all of a sudden it's 80, which causes you to, you know, scratch a little bit about, I mean, hopefully it's because, you know, we've done such a good job of attending to the students as they go up, but, you know, that's always kind of a question that is, is kind of out there. The other issue I was going to just bring up the, the problem with the state data does measure that, but you can't get it broken down by race, which is a problem for, you know, for our race and equity work. We need to, that's why we need to look at it broken down as we well. We can break our own individual data down by race. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right, and moving on to our second um, item on the agenda, um, it's to hear from the long partners. So come on up. And thank you so much for being here and sitting through that first hour. to turn yourself on. I think you're, yeah. Got it, okay. All right, well, thank you for having us. We're excited to be in the space with you. We know some of you know us well, and some of you might be seeing us for the first time. Um, I'm Stacey Lappin. I am the Director of Program at Belong Partners. Uh, you might've heard of us as Sound Discipline. We've been in partnership with Tukwila for the last five years. And we changed our name last May. BELONG stands for Building Equitable Learning Opportunities and Nurturing Growth. And we believe we have a name that lines up with who we are, what we believe and what we do. Um, and we're excited to be here and share a little bit about that with you today. Hi everyone, I'm Aaron Nori Kane. Uh, I use he and pronouns uh, and I'm a facilitator with BELONG Partners. Um, I'm excited to be here with you all. I'll share a little bit about what we do. Um, and if you wanna go to the next slide. 
are, are you guys different from the you know the sound discipline buildings that are all right here that yes right? so that even before that we were different than that okay so we it would get confused you're are you from sound so sound yeah, discipline yeah. and then that's sound mental health right so two different things okay just to clarify thanks <laughs> yeah thanks uh so um just sharing a little bit about who we are and how we do things um i'll have you focus in on the vision uh which is believing in a future where everyone thrives because they know they matter and belong we talked about that idea of belonging um, and our purpose that we want to build more equitable communities, specifically anti-racist when possible, uh, that center the dignity, voice, and agency of young people. Uh, and, and the last part is our, our approach, which is our, that partnership. So when we think about the partnership, we think about how um, we can be uh, attuned to what you all are going through here, specifically in the Tecola School District. And so we know a couple of things that impact uh, educators, scholars, ability to learn and grow. Uh, one of those is COVID, uh, the impact of that, not only on the lagging skills, but also on the just the educational environment. We are underfunded, under-resourced, under a tremendous amount of stress um, within the education system. Uh, the other thing is specifically for you all in Tukwila is the um, amount of students that you have, scholars that you have that are unhoused uh, and, and the impact that that has on their ability to show up and, and be uh, a part of, and for us to support them. Uh, so um, the last part is just that we know that, you know, the education system needs healing, the educators, the adults that are in with your um, young people need that healing support. Next slide, we're, we're fast forwarding through because we're gonna be sure we're on time. So if we do have values, we'll leave them there for you. Um, one of the things that we know is different about our organization um, is that we work with the adults. So we believe we have a direct impact on young people because of the work we do with adults. The, we do not believe that this is about fixing young people. Young people are the resilient, amazing humans that they are destined to be. And we need to have systems that work for them and educators who have the mindset and practices to be able to show up in a way that allows them to bring their authentic voice. And so in partnership with those educators, how do they actually learn and grow? There's no one who goes into education saying, I wanna harm a young person, right? They're there because they care. How do they get more tools and strategies and systems change work to make an impact? I think next slide. One of the other pieces that we work on is how do we become more trauma aware or trauma responsive? And one of the things I appreciate about this is it's not, I'm trauma aware or I'm not. It's in a continuum and I'm moving towards that. And I would say over the last five years, that's really been intentional work across K-12 here in Tukwila to move more towards how do I see behavior is not a problem, but behavior is a solution to a different problem I don't see. Not about people making bad choices, but people who are feeling unsafe, doing unsafe things. What can we do differently? So that move towards that. And it's not like I'm get there, graduate, and I'm done. It's an ongoing work for all the adults in the building from the school leaders to the people who are on the playground or in the lunchroom. Next slide. Oops. Um, okay, the other piece is that uh, the idea that we believe all humans are working toward needing to feel that they're safe, they belong, and they matter. And so those fundamental pieces of what do we do to increase that? So young people spend more time in the classroom. And I think, Carly, you were speaking to how many kids are out? What is the impact academically? We know that they need to be in the room with their educators, with their peers, to have access to learning and community. Next slide. Oops. Uh, so we're going to do, uh, as um, Alex, I believe, our student rep, yeah. uh, mentioned the idea that we learn better when we do. Uh, so we're going to just demonstrate one of the things that we uh, teach, um, which is um, understanding a little bit more about how brains work. And so before I do that, I just wanna point out what we do. Uh, we focus in on, on four main things. We focus in on the trauma responsiveness as Stacy talked about. We focus in on this idea of brain science, which we'll teach you about in a second. Uh, we focus in on social emotional learning and we focus in on equity and anti-racist practices as much as we can move that needle towards that. And what we know is that they're all aligned. When we can be more trauma responsive, we can often, if we do it intentionally, we can move towards more anti-racist practices. So I'm gonna invite you to do this along with me uh, and that's everyone in the room if possible. Uh, so if you wanna hold up your hand, I'm gonna teach you a model about how our brains work. So if you wanna fold your thumb over, fold your fingers over your thumb, this is a model of your brain. Uh, and we're gonna focus in on three main parts. Uh, right here at the base 
This is called your brain stem, and it's responsible for autonomic functions, heartbeat, breathing, that basic stuff, right? Focusing on the thumb, this is our limbic system, uh, which, is, which houses uh, our emotions and our memories. And together, these two create the survival brain, okay? So that is uh, what happens, that's when we have freeze, fight, or flight mechanism, that all happens here in the limbic system, okay? Hold your fingers over, that is your thinking brain, your cortex. And when we think about the fingernail part right here, that's our prefrontal cortex. That's like executive functioning. It's some amazing things like empathy, intuition, understanding where other people come from, making uh, uh, specific choices. That all happens here. And we know what happens to our brain when we uh, are under stress, whether it's real or perceived, is that we increase blood flow to our limbic system and that pops off the top part of our brain and we flip our lid. And that means we are left with emotions and our freeze, fight, or flight. So does that resonate with y'all when you think about getting stressed out? We've got a lot of emotions and we've got our freeze, fight, or flight jumps in. So this model, we actually teach to all the educators we work with. And ideally they're teaching it to all the students that they work with uh, so that we understand the impact of stress, trauma, what happens outside of us in our world, the impact of racism, of you know, all those things have an impact on our ability to learn. Learning happens here in the cortex. And so how do we help educators and schools uh, help young people be able to regulate so that they can be their best selves, so they can show up and learn? So the other piece that we, if you wanna go to the next slide, the other piece, oh, and we're gonna probably skip through that one. Um, all the way through, yep, to this. So one of the things that we think about as well is uh, this idea of how do we understand how neuroscience impacts um, young people uh, and how do we use that to help them show up in schools? Uh, and so oftentimes as educators, we wanna teach, we start with reasoning and we wanna teach them how to do things and focus in on academics and focus in on teaching social emotional learning. But we know we have to start from the bottom up. And so that means starting with regulating. When we have a stressed out nervous system, we, we can't learn. So we have to focus on our regulating first, regulating that nervous system, then the importance of belonging, which is relate, then we can reason and learn. And that's kind of a framework that we often use with our schools and educators. And it's not normal, right? Like a young person does something and we think our job is to step in and solve that problem and talk about it. And the truth is when we're here, we can't hear it anyway. So recognizing that this brain informed approach, I got to turn that triangle upside down and use all my great teaching after we're regulated and connected first. And that leads to being able to do restorative discipline, which is one of the other pieces that we've woven in in Tukwila. How do I look at less exclusionary discipline, less removal, and more about healing the harm, fixing the mistake and returning to community? So how does, how does um, ruler fit into this? Yeah. So ruler, we're going to share a little bit. Okay. Of ruler. Yeah. So okay. we're coming up, but yeah, ruler is the social emotional learning curriculum that Tech Willa has used for the last five or year, four years. Um, and what we've done in partnership is we're not ruler trainers, but we are skilled at working with adults on implementing social emotional learning and, and working with adults. And rule, the idea behind ruler is train a team of educators and then they're leading it in their schools. And so there's people in each school that are leading the ruler work. And then we're helping them to create those meaningful, what does it look like to engage the educators? Because if, if ruler is gonna roll out well, the, the adults have to be holding it and learning and digging in and then doing it with young people. So we've been supporting that work. Um, and I think different schools are to different places, but they're all having awareness and some common tools that are starting. And I would say um, that one of the pieces, well, we'll share, we'll keep going and I'll come there. Thanks for asking. Um, so the different pieces that we've done is work with professional development and coaching. So we've done all staff trainings, we've done small group trainings, we've done cross school work. Um, and then we, so really showing up in ways that are responsive to what the educators need to be able to show up and lead social emotional learning and build communities and create belonging spaces where young people have voice. So we've been doing that work. We've also done a lot of work with data. So having a consistent referral form across the district, implementing the data link system so that you could have Swiss. That was a, a huge accomplishment because before um, you have a Skyward, which is your state reporting up system. 
And that is not very user-friendly for educators to be able to see what is happening in our school live and be able to solve problems around it. So now each school has access to being able to use Swiss, see their data, not through the lens of what's wrong with kids, but really to look at what is not working in our system, what is a lagging skill for a young person or a lagging skill for adults, and what can we do about that? So really shifting that mindset around discipline referrals and using data to do that, and also looking at that disproportionality in data. So really pulling up who is being overrepresented and therefore having less access to learning and community. And then a focus on social emotional learning, supporting that ruler implementation and moving towards restorative discipline. What does it look like when a young person has to be removed from the classroom so that they are brought back into community in a way that allows them to actually connect and engage in learning instead of feel all those barriers that oftentimes keep continuing to push them out the door. Next slide. So little taste of ruler here. Um, this is really around adults learning to build students' skills in social emotional learning. So staffs having charters so that they have agreements, co-created agreements. Who are we as the adults in the building going to be together? How do we share that with kids and how do we consistently check in around that? How do we use the mood meter to check in and teach about where are we? Um, how are we feeling? And not just with colors, um, but really what are those feeling words that goes, go with that, um, how I am and my awareness and my awareness of my peers. And then along with that is focusing on regulation. So um, not just naming that I'm frustrated or I'm angry or I'm disappointed, but what can I do to get more to a place of calm and peace? And not just when I'm feeling those stressful things, but how are we doing regulation regularly and all the time to increase young people's capacity to engage in their community? Um, and so um, this is just a fun example um, from Thorndike where they were working on naming feelings at their school. So they did the teachers all uh, made a feeling faces chart and now they're having students engage in that. And it's just another way to sort of, you have to be able, Dan Siegel, the brain and the hand guy says, you have to name it, be able to name it to tame it. So how do we build kids um, emotional um, language vocabulary? And in America that most of us adults even only have like five words for feeling. So this is about how do we increase that for young people. Next slide. It's interesting before you leave. Oh, go ahead. I'm not sure this is uh, good or not, but I heard the other day, there's actually artificial intelligence programs that are being developed as students walk in the room, look at their face and decide what this is. Oh, <laughs> it could be a little scary, I think. But that's anyway. a, I was going to say, that's kind of <laughs> way to, I don't know, something about that. So. Yeah, I don't, I don't know whether that's good or bad, but that's, you know, that's something yeah. that's going on. And, and I think to that point for us, it's really about how does the educator yeah. show up and ask a young person, how right. are you feeling and use that information to inform how they're going to show up with them the rest of that period, right? Like it's really about how do I have awareness of who's in my community and what are the needs? And also how do I help them know each other, right? This is not, this is not just about individual, this is about a collective. And so when we talk about that regulation in the brain and the hand, we all have mirror neurons, we, we bounce off of each other and we can also co-regulate and help each other. And when we have this language, it takes some of the shame. Any of us who do this, we, I mean, I speak for myself, we all do it. Our not finest moments as parents, as teachers, as humans come out there's a little bit of shame that comes after that. How do we say this is because I have a human brain. My responsibility is to get calm back down, solve that problem and learn to do better next time. And I think that's really a big shift in Tuck Willita, not about kicking you out and not about saying something's wrong with you, but like, how can we hold you accountable and responsible in a way that honors your dignity and your voice and brings you back in? And that's, that's just a flat out life skill that Right? I mean, yeah, it bugs me when they say soft skills because those are the human skills yeah. that we need if we're going to be successful in the world. And if we're going to yep. get to those graduation and all those things we wish for kids, they have to know how to be in community together and they have to know how to communicate and solve problems. So we believe that this is, this is the plate um, that all those academic things become possible with. Okay, I got one more and I made you a better slide, but it might not be here. Oops. Let's see. Um, so this is an example. One of the things that we do is uh, work with a team of educators who are looking at their discipline data regularly. And so this example here was, you know, tier one practice in Showalter is increased regulation, paying attention to transitions at the beginning and the end of the period, educators greeting young people at the door. All those are tier one practices that happen for every young person. But they noticed they were still having an increased number of referrals happening in the hallways during uh, passing periods. What, and the thing that they decided to try was what would happen if we played some music in that time that would signal the kids, this is transition time, the music gets quiet, they go into class, and they noticed that anecdotally, wow, it's calmer, <laughs> feels better, kids are saying it, staff is saying it, and their data showed less referrals. Now they're like, okay, the kids are saying the principal's choosing the music, 
how are the kids going to choose the music, right? How do we get their voice and what's going to actually help us get to class and get where we need to go? Um, and then I don't know if the next slide is here, if you got the next one, because there was a question about what's the data? Do you have that one or not? Oh, you do. Great. Um, so just the question was what's happened at, in that school around referrals over the course um, last year to this year? And um, the actual total number of refer referrals from September to through February, end of February um, is about the same, a little tiny bit less. But what's different is last year, there was a higher number of what we would call, depending on the language you use, in Skyward's offense, in Swiss, it used to be called a major. Now it is called an administrator manager. Those bigger behaviors, there was a significantly larger number of those last year compared to this year. And so even though if you look at, oh, total number of referrals, we didn't decrease it that really at all. We have more, the things that are happening are more what we would consider in Skyward referrals in Swiss minors or educator managed. So that is a shift in how young people are showing up, less of those big behaviors. Those are the things that get handled in the classroom, can be followed up less, um, the, um, you know, like urgent so they can stay in class and have a conversation with a counselor or a behavior interventionist after those things can happen after. And also they're the things that don't result in getting kicked out, right? So there's a shift there that I think is worth noting. And Show Walters worked really hard at paying attention to their data, looking at patterns and making changes. I'm kind of interested, yeah, when you say staff managed, does that mean it was handled in the classroom? Yeah. Okay, but they but somebody still marked it. But down. they're documenting it because we want to see patterns documented. and what's happening. Yeah. Okay, and then the other obvious question that always comes up in that one is, how many of those are these this category of disrespect? You know, uh, disrespect, defiance. Yeah, yeah, and we can pull. We have. I mean, the the, <laughs> inter, the great thing is that there's access to all of that, and that they're looking at that. So that's a okay. school level thing that they're absolutely they're paying attention to. When's it happening? Where's it happening? Who's it happening with? What are the right. color of the young people who are? So right, all right. of that they are looking at regularly, and we're happy to share that with you too. But I just pulled one thing to tell you that story. Yeah, the other part of that is, you know, is it disproportionate in one classroom versus another? Are there some techniques that some teachers should be teaching other teachers, and all of that? Yeah, right, right. And and that is a helpful tool for administrators and coaches to look at that individual. One of the things when we work with the team of educators, we we're real careful that they're not like talking about which teacher is doing what, but they're looking at the system as a whole and they might look at a grade level, but it's really powerful information for school leaders and coaches to say, who needs my support? And we try and shift that language around referrals for the adults too. It doesn't mean I'm a bad teacher if I'm writing referrals. It means I need support in building my skills. That's the other question. If, you, if you're saying it depends on the teacher to report the referral, is there not an incentive to not report the referral? Well, <laughs> I appreciate you saying that because in some districts they do that, right? Like yeah. there's a whole bunch of ways to change your data. Right. Don't let them report, shame them. And, and we really work hard. And I think your school, your school district does a good job of not saying we're gonna cover it up, but like we wanna see the patterns. We wanna have less referrals because kids have skills and teachers have skills and it doesn't look like that. There's all kinds of ways, and I can tell you districts who do that. To yeah, like, yeah. we don't want to have anything to report up. We're yeah, not going to tell right. the truth. I feel like you, uh, and, and it's a calibrating conversation, right? How do we have conversations with the staff? What is it? When do I write a referral? And your hope team, your anti-racist representatives on your school teams are really paying attention to that and bringing that up. And you actually, the whole, we shouldn't even be writing your district is like, we shouldn't even be writing referrals for disrespect because that is a subjective, where our bias plays in. And, and so then we're talking about, well, we can take it off the form, but if we don't change the educator mindset and practice, they're going to check a different box, but it's the same thing. So how do we engage in that conversation around what does disrespect, you know, what, what can I do about that? Because our biases really show up in those subjective things versus physical aggression, that's pretty clear. I think we did it, questions. I have a super random question um, about ruler. So in my experience with ruler, like it's it's okay. Um, I'm just curious and I'm not in any way recommending that we change to a different SEL curriculum, but I'm curious if there are some out in the world that y'all have seen um, that you feel like maybe have uh, just a stronger impact perhaps than ruler. So um, <laughs> that's a great question for us. Um, so Ruler um, has um, a really strong component around the regulation, right? And the awareness of feelings and that. And then it does have the pieces around meta moment and some, some reflective thinking. Um, and it does have the K-12 piece. Um, and I think um, 
you know, we have a little bias that we believe that problem solving class meetings and those kind of pieces are more effective or need to be done in collaboration with that. Mm -hmm. um, so. So are those types of, so community meetings, right? Yeah. Community circles. Mm -hmm. Community mm -hmm. circles. I'm a, something. Yeah. a big proponent of those, right? Yeah. Do them in every single after school program. Are those things that like y'all are just bringing up in your PD and in your coaching as ways to. So we do bring them up and we've done some of that and it's been limited because there was really the pressure around ruler is the thing. So don't get mm. us confused. So we offer that structure and provide that, but it's hard when we're trying to like do ruler well, and then say, don't tell me one more, you know what I mean? So, so there's that tension that we hold. Um, so we're, we're clear about that process and practice and advocate for it. And when there, you know, there are several educators in different schools who've had that workshop, we do our public offer offerings and we offer tech Willow people to come at no charge all the time, just because we want to have them in the space for that. Um, because we think it complements ruler, it doesn't take away from it. Yeah. And you have to have the educator capacity to be able to engage in it, right? And so if they're like, oh. And can I just add the, the other piece of it too, is that social emotional learning doesn't just happen in the context of a curriculum like ruler where you're just doing, uh, you're doing a few things. It happens in the culture of the school and in the culture of the classroom and in the hallways and out on, on the playground. And so that's what we try to do is hold both. We, we know social emotional learning is important so that they're building the skills. And we know that culture is important. Um, how, what kind of ways that we bring young people back into the classrooms rather than pushing them out. So it's that it's, it's really changing the culture of the whole building and uh, ideally the whole district, which is why we're so excited to be able to work with a, a whole district with you all. Uh, it, it's, it's changing a lot of different things. And so, you know, Ruler has a lot of really strong things. And what we hope to bring is a lot more than that uh, to supplement Ruler because it's not bad, it's just limited in what it can do. And so we think about changing, moving from, you know, just social emotional learning as its own siloed thing to this is how learning happens in a school building. We do it as a community. Thanks, Aaron. And I think to add on to that, it's, it's really about for us, it's about that integrated experience for young people, whether I'm five or I'm 15, that what I learn in my classroom and I practice when I'm on the playground or in the lunchroom. And then when I make a mistake, a consistent thing happens in the office, right? So it's that integration of social emotional learning and discipline and systems and practices, which is really the sweet spot of how it all works together. I'm curious how, um... So one of the things we have in our district is a fair amount of mobility, you know, students coming in and out, which, so you can train students on things and then, oh, you got another set of students. I wonder how you, um, yeah, is there anything particular that you, that you have in your systems to deal with that? I mean, it's one thing to be teaching in a, in a school that's got st stability. It's another thing to be teaching in a school that has a lot of mobility going on. Well, I think, I mean, transitions and student voice are really critical. And okay. so it's not just held by that teacher, it's held by the community. And the community right. brings new people in and what are, the, what are the rituals and ways we bring you into community and how do you learn how to be? And we do work in lots of schools that have transient population. I think the advantage, you have lots of kids who bounce even between your three schools. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the advantage of having a shared common language has been helpful. Like, oh, they do this at Showalter or at... Um, Thorndike, they do it at Tech E also. So, so that sense, I think, is helpful that there's some common language across your schools. Um, and then just in general, how do, how do we not have it be held by one, but it is the community? And I think, Aaron, you know, your example of it's the culture of the school and how we are, and it has to be welcoming and belonging for everyone. And I think as you've had a huge influx of new students this year, um, that that has been a big impact. And really, how are we supporting the educators to have the tools? Because the kids don't know what to, like, now I have 29 in my room and how do I create community there and how does everybody's voice matter? So that's been a hard thing and they're holding it. And so we've been in conversation with all the schools around working with that. Yeah, because I think when we talk about like, you know, social emotional learning and adult practice, it is more about the adult practice, right? And the ways in which they create the environment and cultivate the environment that young people can feel that sense of connectedness and belonging and be able to practice those skills. So it's more about what the young, ultimately it is about what the young people are learning, but I, th I think, right, some of the work y'all are doing is less about what young people might be taking away immediately and more about what the adults are doing and the changes of behaviors and practice in adults, um, which I think brings me to a question around, you know, I think 
um, particularly when we're talking about like social emotional practice and racist practices, like it, so much of that starts with self, yes. right? And one's ability to like have some self-awareness um, and then vulnerability, practice um, uh, these skills in front of young people. Um, so I think I'm just kind of curious around what you, your sense of folks comfort level with that is in Tukwila. I would say there's been a lot of growth in that in the last five years. Like I can remember the, the culture here when we first came in and there was not much of that capacity or willingness um, to even engage in that kind of thing. And I really feel like over the last five years, there's really been a shift and an openness and an ask for help and a not, a, not a fear to say, I don't know, and not a fear to say, I could do something different. And one of the things we believe that's because if you come in and you you know, shame people and tell them they're wrong, they're going to push you out the door. But if you sit with people and you build trust and you build relationship and you, and we believe it's pressure to put the mirror up and say, Hey, this is your practice. And this is causing harm and the support to say, what can I do different? I feel like there's a different energy among your school leaders and among staff to be open to it. They're hungry for the professional development. Every time we're there, they're all in, they're wanting to engage. And then they're actually trying things and they get really, and they can see impact. So even when they're discouraged and even when they're tired, they are trying and they're open to it. And I just add that, you know, when we think about, I mean, white supremacy thrives on this perfectionism, thrives on this, the way of being that says like, if you make a mistake, you're out of here, something's wrong with you. And so the way that we come in is, you know, as Stacy said, we partner with, you know, these educators and, and we, we show up over and over again. It's not just a one and done where, here's what you do, do it this way or something's wrong with you. But we show up over and over again, as much as we can get in the school and get in front of the educators and be with them uh, to, to help them see that mistakes aren't something that you should be ashamed of, that you should get shamed on. It is about learning. And, and this, that's exactly what we um, teach them, work with them on how to be with their students so that they create a culture in their school of mistakes are opportunities to learn. So that we really lean into that to, as a way to move towards more anti-racist practices. As we see, it's just, we're learning together. And, and we do that without blame, shame, or pain. We do that by showing up again and again as community valuing humanity and valuing people over product, people over performance. I think there's a lot of leadership amongst your staff like yours. I, I, what I love about Tukwila is your five schools, right? Like there's potential to have so much impact for young people. And I see educators stepping up and leading um, a lot. So that feels encouraging to me. Hi, I'm Charlie, District 3. <clears throat> I have not been in front of you guys before. So I have just a couple of questions is, um, for example, this year, are you guys in front of staff and students? Um, how often is that? Also, what is the cost of belong partners to the district? So we work with the adults. So we don't work directly with the young people. So our service is really about working in front of we, every, every school has had professional development multiple sessions. So on their Wednesdays or in August, we've done a lot of professional development across all five schools. We work with different teams. So there's data teams, ruler teams, uh, principal coaching. So we do, we've been doing that all year across all five schools, different school. And there's a team of us. So each school has two facilitators that are working directly with them and have been with them over the journey. Um, and the contract this year um, in uh, 23, 24 was about $200,000. Okay. So, and then I heard you say that you have two facilitators. How often are they in the schools? Uh, a couple times a month. Um, for me, for training or meetings or those kind of things, and then coaching hours in addition to that. So specifically, like we, I'm just trying to like a couple mm -hmm. times. Is that like a one hour? Is it two hours? Is it four so hours? So professional development is usually two to three hours a time, okay. and meetings are a couple hours a month, and then coaching hours are sometimes an hour or two hours a session. So total per month, how often is belong partners in a school? Yep. Um, question probably. Uh, Overestimate total across, across all, all the schools, schools or, or just one for school? one school? It, well, I, I'm a, uh, five what, to eight hours, I would say five, five to, eight, to eight, eight hours per school yeah. per month. Yeah. And then you have two staff, and is that the same two that's 
all of our all of our schools? No, each or? school has a team of two. Okay. So, and then we work as a so team. It's sort of, yeah. Eight hours or so per month, two staff that's there in front of our. And, and I think some are more. And so, you know what I mean? I would say some, like I'm at Thorndike a lot more than that. So, I mean, it, it's kind of what they're accessing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, some is more than that. Okay. Thank I you. I just want to add on that, you know, it, it is different depending on the school. And that's what we ideally can do. And our education system is highly taxed right now and so like you know there are times where the school has something come up and so they have to switch things around and so you know that that's not they're doing the best that they can i want to say that and I, that's why i keep going back to our education system uh is not not well sourced resourced not well funded um is struggling really um and it's not just here i mean it's everywhere so i, I just bring that up to like share that you know in an ideal world, we're in there re really regularly, and it doesn't always happen because of the way things go. And we aim to be responsive. So if someone calls you the night before and like, hey, can you come? We have a cancellation. Can you come do a thing on Wednesday? And we show up. So we're really trying to be um, responsive to the needs of that community, of each of the communities and, and what they're going through. Kind of curious, how many other schools, districts are you working with? We are locally, we're in 19 different schools. Um, and then we have districts um, or schools uh, that's 19 schools in our whole. So in our, in our like sort of whole school support way that we do, we do lots of other schools where we do professional development, some one-off coaching, but where we think of deep partnership and relationship, like we're in Tequila is 19 schools. And then um, we have our district model, which is primarily right now in Southern Oregon. And there's another um, 14 schools there. And are these schools, you just, um, when you talked about under-resourced, you hit my one of my favorite buttons that I've been working a lot with the state on. And I'm, so that's what I'm curious. Are you, the schools you're working with, are they primarily a high degree of free and reduced lunch? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we work in mostly the roadmap region, Renton, yeah, yep. Kent, Federal Way, Highline. Auburn. I might be Auburn. interested in yeah. tapping you guys for some testimony for our legislators to try we would to, be honored that's to one, get of our, them one of our goals is to be able to get in there and let them know how it's not yeah so yeah my mind is, is going pretty fast about that because they don't they don't understand this idea of equity and funding correct and so you guys would be a good resource thanks i'll put that yeah happy to share about that because we are in that's that's the prime the population we primarily serve and say also not only that just to add on to that director larson it's not just um, equity and funding, but actually what is SEL? Mm -hmm. So, yes. <laughs> and I'll just share, I've known them for a long time. I think I was one of your part. You were a partner school. I was, you and I, and I was a, a pilot school. and I was yeah. a pilot school yeah, for Jody McVitie yeah. way back. So I've been working with them a long time and, um, it's evolved and I worked with them when they had no books and no resources and, mm -hmm. um, or any of that. So, um, and what I, the one thing I will share, which I appreciate, which is back to the question about um, anti-racism in that is they've always had on their board um, people who actually do that work in their lives. Um, so Caprice Hollins, Dr. Mia Williams, Dr. Caprice Hollins, like all of these folks um, who actually do uh, anti-racist work, um, uh, focus on, um, and so that's something that's always been appealing to me. So that's embedded in the work. And then to answer your question about funding, it's something we are reviewing. So we are working with Belong Partners to uh, scale back the model a little bit because we can't uh, fully fund what we're funding and they're working with us on that um, and trying to manage out what we can do uh, to keep our relationship, uh, to keep some of the work going. Because uh, the last thing I wanna do is um, uh, stop the work because we and we so we invested a lot this year um, and now we're going to re, 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 uh, reset a little bit uh, with the hope that as we continue to go we can continually to modify I know they do MTSS work as well through the behavioral lens so it's something we're thinking about including that in the work but we are um, analyzing the budgetary pieces especially for next year and what can we do to maintain our partnership but still deliver um, some ongoing work for our schools. So it's something we're doing right now. But yeah. you see, that's the kind of thing that, <laughs> I mean, it's too late for this legislative session, but we could convince potentially, you know, get funding for 
quote, a pilot. They love mm -hmm. to do pilots yep. Yep. <laughs> and then demonstrate that it's yep. really works. And then, yeah. so anyway, that's, yeah. 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 And just to add on to your point about the social emotional learning can often be um, something to do to kids. And we are really clear social emotional learning is about the adults and about what we do with in community. And I think that is the piece that makes it different and anti-racist and about community. So uh, we think that that's a really important foundational piece. I think just to add, you know, because budget of course came up and you know, we're having a, a larger discussion around our budget, but you know, it was no accident that um, these two items today, our expectations ethics for all was partnered with this, right? Because as Aaron mentioned, like this is so foundational to a young person even being able to be in a learning environment and actually retain anything, right? Because if we're, you know, we've got young people that have just immigrated here, right? Mm -hmm. And there's already a, a, a likely some trauma, right? And some impact. And so it's e so easy for that lid, right? To get flipped. And when our lids flipped, there's zero critical thinking, zero reasoning, as you all pointed out before. And so this is like the baseline foundation for anything else that we need to do as an educational system to work and be effective. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't an accident. Um, and this should be a continuous priority of our district as we, if we want to improve educational outcomes. Additional thoughts, questions? Um, um, I also I was did have. A, you were going to ask us a question. Oh yes, <laughs> um, it's more of a comment than a question. Like I, I actually did work with Belong Partners at for the Mindful Mentors Project yes. at uh, Intercola Elementary School, where we like followed the eight, eight week curriculum, and each session had a routine where we begin with breathing exercises, and then we did like a learning activity. Like for example, we did do brain in the hand, and like taught it to the students. And like we were just talking about, we did survey students at like the beginning and the end of each cohort. And we noticed that like the quieter students like opened up a little bit more and the louder ones were like, were able to control their impulses more than before than when they first started the program. So I feel like that really highlights the importance and like versatility and impact of mindfulness. And I did wanna quickly add on, like um, this program could also help like, um, what's it called? Like with the issue we have with champions right now, like this could be like a low maintenance program to like implement into schools again, maybe to help like, Keep yeah. pushing for mindful Everyone mentors is. to come back, Alex. Good idea. Yeah. very much for being here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you all so much. Appreciate it. Sounds like great work you're doing. Appreciate thank you. you. All right. Well, look at this. We're going seven minutes early. So we'll make a, make a motion uh, to adjourn today's meeting. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Emphatically right. second. We are officially adjourned. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. No. <laughs> we have a special meeting after this? No, no. I can <laughs>